Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Walmart stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Walmart is a retail chain of discount department stores and grocery stores. Its headquarters are in Arkansas. The company was founded by Sam Walton in 1962. It also owns and operates Sam's Club's retail warehouses. The company has 11,510 stores in 27 countries. It is the world's largest company in terms of revenue. It is also the largest private employer in the world with 2.2 million employees. Sam Walton's heirs own over 50% of Walmart. The company's investments outside of the U.S. have seen mixed results. Its operations and subsidiaries in Canada, the U.K., Central America, South America, and China are successful, but its ventures failed in Germany and South Korea. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 400 billion market cap. They're trading at 141 a share, and they have 2.8 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has a lot of free cash flow each year. It peaked in a trailing 12 months at 23 billion. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that also peaked in the trailing 12 months at 18 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that grows each year. It was half a trillion in 2018, up to 542 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. And they had their highest gross profit in the trailing 12 months. Below that is operating expenses, and below that is operating income. Their operating income is pretty consistent, 20 to $22 billion a year. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, $2.4 billion of interest. Then below that is other income and expenses. This is usually impairments or investments. Then below that is pre-tax income. Then their taxes. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. They had their highest net income in the trailing 12 months of $18 billion. That's because their other income and expenses was $5 billion. In 2019, for instance, they had negative $8 billion of other income and expenses. That's why their net income was so low. I would focus on operating income when I look at a business because the stuff below that is not part of their operational business and it can really skew the numbers. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. And free cash flow is the money you can use to pay a dividend, pay down debt, buy back stock, or invest back into your business. They have a ton of free cash flow each year. The most in the trailing 12 months at $23 billion. The company does pay a dividend, but it looks like it buys back lots of stock. It bought back $8 billion in 2018, then $7 billion, then $6 billion, then $3 billion. When a company buys back stock, this decreases the number of shares in the market, which makes the remaining shares more valuable. In 2018, they issued $7.5 billion of debt and paid down $16 billion of debt. So they decreased their debt load $9 billion in 2018. They increased it about $12 billion in 2019. They increased it another $3.5 billion in 2020. And they decreased it $3 billion in the trailing 12 months. Let's look at their operating cash flow. This company has a ton of operating cash flow. The way you calculate that, you start with net income. That was $18 billion. Then you add back the depreciation. That was $11 billion. Depreciation is an expense on your income statement. That brings down your net income, but it's a non-cash item, so you have to add it back on the cash flow from operations section. Remember that big positive in other income and expenses? They had a positive $5.2 billion gain, but that's a non-cash item, so we have to subtract that out on the statement of cash flows. They also had a positive $7.4 billion in changes in working capital, 
So the company actually generated $33 billion of cash flow, even though they reported an $18 billion profit. Because it's good to look at operating cash flow. That's a better indicator of a company's health than net income. Because you could see net income is pretty volatile. 10 billion down to 7 billion, up to 15 billion, up to 18 billion. But operating cash flow is a lot smoother. 28 billion, 28 billion, 25 billion, 33 billion. Operating cash flow takes net income and converts it to cash. Let's look at a capital structure. $82 billion of equity, $72 billion of debt. They're 53% equity, 47% debt. And their net debt is 63 billion. Net debt is debt minus cash. And their WAC is 6.2%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 635 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $575 billion. We divide that by 2.8 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 203. They're trading at 141, so they're trading at a 31% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply, Wall Street values the company at 165. They're also saying it's undervalued, just not as much as me. This is one of those stocks that only goes up over time. As you can see, it pretty much goes up little by little over time. This company raises its dividend a little each year. They're up to 54 cents a share. And their dividend yield is 1.5%. They pay out 34% of their net income and 26% of their free cash flow. This company has a low beta, 0.42, so the stock moves half what the market moves. And the stock has gone up 21% in the past 52 weeks, which is better than the S&P 500, which went up 15% in the same time frame. The 52-week low was 102, the high was 153. And the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 8 million shares are traded each day for this stock. And of the 2.8 billion shares outstanding, only 1.4 billion are on float. Half the shares are held by the Walton family. 30% of the shares are held by institutions. And only 1% of the shares on float are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have tripled your money if you're still holding the stock. Walton Enterprises, which is the family, owns 35% of the stock. Then the Walton Family, which is another entity, owns 13% of the stock. Vanguard owns 5%, then BlackRock, then State Street. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 11. The median is 14. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 22.3, so investors are paying $22 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 0.7, which is an amazing price to sales ratio. The reason they have such a strong price to sales ratio is because they have so much sales and they only converted 3% of those sales into net income. Their PE ratio is not as good as the average, but their price sales ratio is much better than the average because they have so much sales. They just don't convert a lot of the sales to profit. But 3% of half a trillion dollars is still $18 billion, which is a ton of money. If a manufacturing company had 3% margins, they would go out of business. They couldn't survive on 3%. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 4.9, which is between the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities on the balance sheet and have $82 billion of equity, $44 billion of tangible equity, because they have $31 billion of goodwill on their balance sheet. The only way a company can get goodwill onto its balance sheet is when they acquire another company for more than its net assets. Interest coverage ratios EBIT over interest expense. They can cover their interest payments more than eight times. ROE is net income over equity. They have a great ROE at 22%. Current ratios, current assets over current liabilities. They're at 0.8. They can cover 80% of their current liabilities with their current assets. These giant companies generally don't have a current ratio above one. They don't really need to pay their vendors on time. They don't need to keep a lot of cash on their balance sheet. They could always get funding whenever they want. They could also pay people late if they want to. Walmart holds all the cards. Their current assets are $9.5 billion of cash, $6 billion of receivables, and $44 billion of inventory. So the company does seem to have enough capital to get through the next 12 months without needing more debt. 
because they did have $23 billion of free cash flow. Their working capital is negative $16 billion, and they had a $6 billion dividend payment. But they do have enough funding, assuming they have a similar free cash flow in 2021. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Big Lots, Costco, Dollar General, and Dollarama, all in the same industry as Walmart. And if Walmart has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're a little better in PE. They're much better in price of sales. They have a positive price to book. The average is negative. They are lower than average in current ratio. ROE, they're 22%. They have a great ROE. They're lower in debt than the average. And they're the biggest company on this list by far. They're bigger than all the companies combined. And Costco is on the list. And they also pay a good dividend. So to summarize, this is a giant of a company. You can't go wrong holding this stock long term because it will go up over time. I rank their free cash flows 10 out of 10. They have such strong free cash flows and they had the highest in the trailing 12 months, a time when others are struggling. Half a trillion dollars is unbelievable and it's going up each year. And I rank their ratios 10 out of 10. Even though they have a current ratio below one, I don't think it really matters. Everything else is so strong, they don't need to have a current ratio above one. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.